Andre's first question refers to an old post on the Casting Shadows blog about an old Mech Warriors house rules, where I compiled a list of some of the changes and house rules we had made to Battletech long ago. And the item that he uh, singled out in particular was a continuous initiative system. And as I mentioned in the blog post, this was kind of a riff that uh, a friend of mine and I did on the type of phased initiative that you see in games like Starfleet Battles. If you haven't played Battletech, initiative works like this. You roll and the highest roll has the initiative, meaning that the people who have lost initiative from lowest to highest move first so that the person with initiative is able to observe all the other movement prior to moving themselves. This happens this way because the firing phase, or you know, the, the actual combat phase of the turn, happens after movement. So all range is determined and all uh, modifiers are determined by movement, and then combat is determined. So this phased initiative system is completely different. It completely changes the nature of the game. Instead of the lowest initiative moving, followed by the next lowest initiative moving, and so on, on up to the winner moving last, and then everybody declaring fire, and fire being simultaneous at that point, because it occurred in an abstracted sense somewhere during movement, we don't do it that way. With a phased initiative system, Depending on how fast your mech, in this case, is moving, that determines how often you move in one turn. And at any point during that turn of movement, you could fire on an opponent. This would be closer to what you experience in a video game, where you pull your trigger when you feel you're more likely to hit. So uh, this creates... Uh, a more, quote, realistic experience of combat than the traditional uh, Battletech system does. Now, the main thrust of the question was, is it still in development? And if we're not using it, why not? Well, we used it for quite a while. And it led to other innovations, like uh, a different form of critical hits and a different way to target specific sections of the mech, all of which, as I said before, completely changed the nature of the game. So much so that it didn't feel like Battletech anymore. And that was really what put the end to this development cycle. It was fun, it worked well, there were no real mechanical complaints about it, but it wasn't our Tuesday night Battletech Knight anymore. And it made pilots and your tactical decisions so effective at a certain point that the resource management aspect of the game, salvage and uh, the collection of these broken parts to try and keep your mechs in motion, it made it really too easy. And that was the end of that plan. I haven't used the continuous initiative system for Battletech for a really long time. And when this particular play-by-post uh, campaign started, we didn't even discuss it. Uh, mostly because it meant that I would be continuously initiativing <laughs> here all by myself while the players just got to sit back and role play on the other side of the earth. And, you know, who needs that? Andre's second question asks about play by post, or PBEM, as I've been calling it recently, play by email. And which games I, which games that I don't get to play would I like to try playing this way, and with whom in the brigade would I like to play them? 
I'm going to limit my choices. Anyone who's seen the video here first who knows there were a lot of games <laughs> that I don't get to play or I've never gotten to play that I'd like to try. I'm going to limit my choices just to three, and we'll start with the games. The first such game that I would mention is this one, which is going to be very difficult for you to see. This is Aeon, uh, which White Wolf was forced to rename as a game called Trinity, which you would maybe better recognize with its uh, soft cover cover. Voila! Hope, Sacrifice, and Unity. Part of the, the Aeon cycle of games. So, Adventure, Aberrant, and Trinity. <laughs> I've run Trinity a fair bit. Um, but I've never really gotten to finish anything I've started with that game, and it's reached the point uh, of frustration. And as there are a lot of uh, White Wolf players, or people who are becoming interested in White Wolf of various eras, I think it'd be very easy to start up uh, a game based on Storyteller. So running Trinity would would uh, not be challenging mechanically. Why would I pick this game otherwise? There are many opportunities for for just about anything you can imagine in a sci-fi situation. If you haven't seen this game before, take a troll around the internet and uh, see what you find. Trinity was an excellent game. Which I don't think got as got enough love at the time, and is currently undergoing a revival. Trinity, spelled A E O N, a science fiction game of hell, wild ass adventures against giant monsters, political machinations, and all kinds of crap you can do to your fellow man. The next game that I'd like to mention is All for One, a Regime Diabolique. Now again, I've gotten to run this quite a bit, so I'm kind of breaking the rules here, but I have not been able to run it online or as a PBEM. And at the point where the players of, of that group that I was running the game for moved away, including me, I moved away, and uh, and the, the player playing Vincent moved back to the States. We were just about to take it online to test out Hangouts and to test out running games through G+. Now, I eventually had to test out using G+, using my MechWarrior campaign, and it's working out really well. But I really wanted to see how I could translate the swashbuckling action and adventure and supernatural horror of All for One into that format. And so All for One would be the next game that I choose. By Triple Ace Games, All for One, Regime Diabolique. If you don't have it, you should. All for One, Regime Diabolique by Triple Ace Games, a game of supernatural swashbuckling horror featuring a style of play similar to The Three Musketeers, but with werewolves and vampires and the Inquisition. The third game on my list that I would try is Brass and Steel, and this is a fairly little-known game that I like quite a bit. It's a steampunk style game. It's by a small new company named Pamian Games. And it's kind of interesting in that it incorporates simultaneously an understanding and rules for LARP as well as tabletop play. And their appearances at Gen Con and other large cons tend to focus on the LARP side, although the, the printed rules focus more on the the traditional tabletop RPG side. 
I'm not much into LARP, but the lightness, yet effectiveness of the rules, and the way in which they just do their job and stay in the background without it being too much of a dice-controlled game or a bidding kind of game. Uh, there aren't a lot of things to do during a resolution, resolution phase except you know, roll your dice, see what you get, and go. So in the online format, either in Hangouts or uh, in text, that is a bit of a godsend. Uh, it's pretty much the opposite of, of trying to run uh, Mech Warrior. So playing with a game that light in a setting that strong, that very you know evocative Victorian steampunk setting uh, would be great. And the aspects of Brass and Steel which differentiate it from other such games like Victoriana or even uh, Tag's Leagues of Adventure are really that it combines Victorian sensibilities not so much with weird science but with believable unreal science. Um, and it also combines in a strong occult theme, and again, not from the presence of a supernatural world like elves and other strange creatures, but more from the sense of divination, uh, dream magic, and, and that sort of thing. So you wind up with a very moody, atmospheric game, which could go in the direction of international espionage, or you know, Honor Majesty's Secret Service in Steam, <laughs> uh, Sherlock Holmes, and so on. So this would be a very interesting and challenging game to play with members of the Brigade. Brass and Steel, a game of steampunk adventure by Pamian Games. Now for my comments so far, I guess it's pretty obvious that I would expect to be the Game Master in all of these situations, but there is <laughs> one exception. Of these three games, I would dearly love to play All for One. And if the opportunity presented itself for someone to run All for One, either in text or in a hangout, I would cheerfully be a player. The section of this question, which is probably of the most interest to Brigade members, is who among them would I enjoy trying these games with? And that's a difficult question. How do you pick among, uh, well, how do you pick among strangers? And no one likes leaving people out of lists, but to choose the personalities that I think would best match a game, Looking at all three of these games, uh, a style of play that would match all three would be action and intrigue. So who would I like to play that style of game with? Action and intrigue. I think I would pick, in this case, Martin Brown from Grognard Games, uh, Bolt Orange, Same Old G, and I would normally like to go with four, but I'm going to go up to six. I would love to play with Carl, Natural 20 Games, and the, to round things out to five, I think it would be fabulous to have our host for this, Andre C. Martinez, involved. To balance out the action and intrigue themes that I mentioned. Now, each of these games comes with a very different setting and very different rule style. But all of these people have demonstrated to me an interest in good role play in what sometimes gets negatively referred to as system mastery but you know a willingness to get into how the game works right to make the game better and i appreciate that in players fellow players or players with me as game master and they all whether they will admit to it or not tend toward the immersive gameplay, which I like. And some of them are not too far off from the simulationist style, 
which I like. So the sixth pick is the hardest. And I think, even though there are many people that I'd like to list, like Emergent Play or Brian Gregory, who I feel a lot of camaraderie with, I think the person I would pick for this style of game, despite you know, personal preference or whatever, would be Disemvowel, a very, very clever member of the YouTube RPG Brigade we don't hear anywhere near enough from that I think would be killer in this sort of game. Andre's third question deals with my simulation series and asks if I would be open to the idea of showing it in action. And while I'm not the biggest fan of actual plays, I mean, I, I do think they're very helpful and they can at times be interesting, they can also at times be horribly boring slogs. So I don't think I would ever upload an actual play that went from start of session to end of, of session. Um, but I would definitely put forward a clip that actually demonstrated a particular style of play in action. And uh, I have every intention, as I've mentioned, of producing clips of the RuneQuest series um, once that gets going. And uh, we'll be more than happy to, to share our gaming experience and, you know, debate uh, or discuss simulation and action. So yeah, definitely. Love to do that. As a caveat, a lot of what makes simulation what it is, is the internal aspect of, of what goes on. The enjoyment of the players in many cases is something that's going on inside and there's no real need to to broadcast it or make it explicit uh, even to the other players what they notice about the way you're portraying your character uh, contributes to their own inner life or their inner experience and uh, I'm not sure how that would actually translate to film I mean in person you know you're connecting with these people and you're you're role-playing through the scene. On film, I, I'm, I'm actually really quite curious to see what exactly that would look like in the end. Of course, it may end up looking like just a normal game. Question four mainly dealt with genre. Through the expression that I've been doing on my blog of talking about the game Tech Noir. And in Tech Noir, the game system itself is built around the principles of the genre it's trying to emulate and sparked uh, my videos and posts on the concept that genre is rule zero. In other words, no matter what we do, the games that we play produce a story and that story is in a genre. So intentionally or unintentionally, we are, you know, portraying a certain type of game. It's when we sit down with the intent to take on a different type of game that uh, that skill is required or that knowledge is required. So if you were sitting down to play Godlike, for example, a World War II game of superheroes, there are a couple of genre elements mixed there which for some groups might be ignored to you know become a wild romp of uh, superpowered humans trashing tanks and for others might be a very serious exploration of what it would be like to be someone from that era who discovers that they have these abilities while their you know their their brothers and countrymen are are dying in droves under machine gun fire and and the like um, what you do with the genre is a reflection of your group. It's a reflection of your the way you have fun. And you can either produce a genre by just going with the flow, or you can choose to 
provide the genre as an experience, make it a, an active part of play. So in tech noir, the noir elements are bonded with cyberpunk to create a specific kind of character that will function mechanically through the tenets of noir. And I don't want to get into the details of what that all is, but basically the game system itself won't let you play another way. Now, the, Andre's question is, does it work? I have played it. We've run play tests of it, both in beta and after it was released. And I have also recently written a blog post about it called uh, Enforcing Genre Fidelity Mechanically. And it definitely... The game mechanics definitely mean that players who get it players who, who understand the genre and create characters from that genre and role-play them with fidelity, they will be rewarded. They will function as they are, are envisioned, and they will have all of the advantages that the game provides. Character, or players who don't get it, who produce characters that are not from the genre and do not play them because they don't understand, with fidelity to that genre will not be able to benefit from the way that the mechanics work and they will therefore be penalized and also probably fairly confused because the story elements themselves are also generated through a rule mechanic and so yeah does it work well it definitely enforces a type of play it works in that regard more important to me was whether or not the game could teach the genre not by reading the fluff or or by getting you know all the the movies of that same genre and watching them and learning that way but by sitting down with no experience about the genre and playing the game can you learn the genre and i'm not convinced yet that you can but a part of that may be that in tech noir itself noir while bandied about a lot and has even become a you know a, a new spin on the Savage Worlds Deadlands setting. Even though noir is, is talked about a lot, not a lot of people really have familiarity with what it really is. It's like saying pulp and no one really knowing what you're talking about. So I'm going to come in on mechanically, yes, the game will make you, if you are aware of the genre in the first place, make you feel like you're playing in, uh, very firmly in that genre and help you stay in it. If you don't know what the genre expectations or, or the genre elements are, I think it would be very confusing and maybe frustrating. Um, you might feel like you had your agency robbed or you're being uh, just generally confused about, about uh, how it is you're supposed to get anything done. Um, and I'll leave that there further experimentation to expand my answer in the future. Andre's last question concerned Korea. And while this is a fairly easy one to answer, although you're not going to see much in this clip, yes, the, the series on Korea will continue and we'll look at restaurants. I've actually tried to film in restaurants a few times and mostly because of the background noise and uh, and lighting conditions. I know that's funny for me to say. Um, these videos haven't worked out, but I've got some ideas for how to get a better <laughs> a better take on things and uh, make things actually look edible. <laughs> but there are a lot of very specific eating and drinking customs, uh, which to make any game set here absolutely have to be discussed, and they're top of my list for the future. Part of the reason for, de for the delay has been I haven't quite decided what I want to do with the Shadows Cast format. I did one year of those. I got through ten episodes in that one, in Volume 1. And for Volume 2, I don't really want to do the 30, you know, 40 minute length clips anymore. Um, but uh, at the same time, having those 
little segments of ideas or information. I, I do kind of like that, uh, that kind of distillation. So when I have a clearer idea of how I want uh, that particular set or series of clips to continue, um, the Korea clips will come along at a steadier rate. Um, I don't want to put them up independently, um, mainly because I don't really want them to be searchable for people who are looking for information about Korea in general, like for example travel information or you know, whatever. Um, I just want them to be a gaming resource uh, for people like you and me. So stepping out of the shadows for a moment, here is an example of Korean gaming culture, just to round out this episode, or this set of answers for Andre. There are many interesting and unusual games in Korea. This particular one I'm going to show you is mainly played by families. It's typically accompanied by gambling, but it doesn't have to be. And it's well, the game itself is essentially uh, the simulation of a horse race. And the randomizing mechanic is called Ute. And Ute are four pieces of wood. <laughs> right? Now, if you take a look, it's rounded except on this one side. Okay? And these four sticks, or these, these Ute, are intended or they're able to generate a number from one to five and that's the randomizing mechanic so if we and you throw the ute right so people do all kinds of things just like <laughs> just like the way we roll dice to get the uh, the ute to fall uh, but they all need to fall on the map Okay, and I'm going to show you the map in a minute. And the map that I have is just a temporary one, uh, basically because my dogs ate the other one. <laughs> well, not ate it, but you know, tore it to pieces. But anyway, you would. Uh, and this is a hard countertop, so you would drop, drop the sticks, and in a much more dramatic fashion than that. And the sticks will, or the the ute will be either flat up, like this one, or flat down like this one. So in this case, we've got one down and one, two, three up. Okay, so one down and three up, which would count as one point. Okay, so this would be two points, this would be three points, this would be four points. So then you ask, how do you get five points? Five points is all flat faces up. Okay. Now in the game itself, if you roll, or you know, if you roll a four or a five, you get to roll again. So here's my trashy paper board. And basically you'll see it's a large rectangle or square. Uh, with an X through the center. And you'll probably, yes, you can see these arrows. So this is the start section and you travel around the board. And as soon as you get to this first corner, you have a decision to make. Are you going to go through the center or are you going to go all the way around? And while that may seem like a no brainer, there are multiple people playing, each with multiple counters. All right? Now this particular game that I have here only comes with enough counters for, for two people. But you each have four counters that you need to get back here. It's, it's like a horse race. And it's a game where you can jump over other players and you can knock them off the board and they go back to start and that sort of, that sort of thing. So it's a fun strategy game. And sometimes you want to send them around so they can come up behind other players and knock them off. And sometimes you want to go around the long way because no one goes a long way. <laughs> so as long as there's a lot of fighting here in the center, um, you have a chance of getting around without any interference. And it's very difficult for someone to try and, and chase you unless they cut you off at the pass. So uh, it's an interesting little game. So you can move one space, two space, 
three spaces, four spaces, or five spaces. And if you're going four or five spaces, you're going to roll again so you can go even farther. So it's a pretty interesting randomizing mechanic, I feel. Now, each of these uh, numbers has, has a name. So you know, to go back, we have, uh, to go back, we have, if they're all laying flat except for one, right, this gives us one point or allows us to move one space. And this is called do. Then if we have two, this is called ge. This gives us two points or two moves forward. This is called gol for three points. And this is called yut and gives you a re-roll. That's four points. And then again, if they're all down flat, this is the five pointer and this is called mo. Now, this is not normal Korean counting. This, I've only encountered it for this game, but there you go. So this is a, a quick family game, this gambling horse race thing. Uh, it's usually played during national holidays like the Lunar New Year or during the Korean Thanksgiving. So to finish out this monster clip, I would like to thank Andre sincerely for the vast amount of time and effort he put into going over everything that I've produced so far and coming up with questions that were interesting for me to answer and hopefully of some interest to the people out there who choose to watch them. My channel, Casting Shadows, is pretty far from the mainstream, and uh, the attention that you've paid to it uh, is appreciated. Your insight, as always, is inspiring, and I look forward to seeing just how far you're going to go with the series and where you're going to stop next. Thank you very much.